So good evening everyone. Welcome to um, the next of our WSCT School London webinar series where we've got a very special one um, today with Hal Sunderland Cohen, um, a great Israeli ambassador for Wines of, of Israel. Um, he is going to present to us um, a whole um, a whole great presentation on the wines of Israel, all the ins and outs. You know, for those of you who are studying, for those that you aren't studying, I think this is going to be a um, really fascinating overview. Um, I'm personally very excited um, to understand a bit more. So, um, yeah, so let me hand over now um, to Tal. Um, as I um, mentioned, please type any questions that you have in the chat um, and we will answer those at the end. Um, of the um, of this webinar, so I'm going to be quiet now, mute myself, and uh, hand over to, to Tal. Thank you, Tal. And welcome. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure and honor being on this uh, webinar. Uh, I'll introduce myself um, uh, shortly. My name is Tal Sunderland Cohen. I've been a, a wine journalist uh, for um, for many years. For the last uh, seven years, I was working for Globes. Uh, newspaper, which is our economic magazine, which is like um, like the Financial Times, I guess, in, in Britain. I wrote books about wine in spirit, I'm acting as a judge in wine competitions, and um, also uh, I give a lot of seminars and courses and, and webinars and, and Zoom to um, its um, it's, it's different these times. I'm also acting as the wine ambassador. Uh, so if someone wants to ask me just anything, just uh, tell at the wine ambassador. That's my email. It's read.gmail.com. And um, what else? What else? Um, I was uh, chosen as the man of the year for uh, Vino magazine. Um, so that's it. This is me eventually. And today we're, um, I'm located, uh, I'm actually uh, located uh, half of the time I'm in Tel Aviv, half of the time in London, and I'm traveling a lot. So uh, you can reach me uh, almost um, all around the globe. Right, so um, Israeli wine, very excited. I mean, it's funny because when you think about Israeli wines, you, you try, you know, people ask me, where do we look located? Is this is the you know, wine connoisseur asked me, is it the old world wine? Is it the new world wine? Where is it uh, exactly? And I said, no, it's not there. It's not there. Actually, we belong to the, maybe a new category, ancient wine world. Because if you think about our area, uh, including um, Turkey and Cyprus and Georgia and Georgia and, and Lebanon and Armenia and Greece, all these um, Mediterranean uh, wines, uh, wineries, we're talking about not years ago, we're talking about 10,000 years ago when the Vitis Vernifera actually started uh, in Israel. So without uh, further ado, let's, let's start uh, scrolling the, um, the, um, the presentation. And um, we'll go um, quickly on the, some slides so we know the history of uh, um, Israel. So if we're talking about Eastern Mediterranean, as I mentioned, we're talking about 10,000 years ago. Um, at the time, they used to make wine, but for different purposes. Of course, the most dangerous thing to drink at that time was water yes water was very dangerous because you know um, if you think about mediterranean it's kind of a dry hot country water is very expensive to find so you need to drill uh, holes in the ground to have wells maybe streams of water none of well most of them were not really pure so the best thing to do is to combine water and wine and then with the alcohol, the combination is wonderful because then the alcohol affects the water and you can drink it with a bit of a smile on your face, which is excellent. Um, the Bible mentioned wine all the time. I mean, when you walk in Israel, when you go to wineries or even just touring in Israel, you'll find ancient wineries all over from the north to the south. You'll find those places that used to be, people used to step on top of um, the grapes and make uh, vines. 
hundreds of ancient... Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Cohen, sorry. Are you showing yes. us any presentation? Because we, go, we cannot see your presentation. Oh, you cannot? Are you present? No. Yes, yes, yes. Something? I am, Please. I am. <laughs> You cannot see my presentation, so uh, we'll start. Uh, we'll um, we'll try to. Um, it's fine. It's fine uh, now. Share it's fine. It again. We can see how it's fine. We can see it. Please, if you have an issue, just write it in the chat box. It's fine. Please continue what you're doing, Cal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, in the Bible, from when we talk about Noah. And, and the, the, the first actually uh, person that uh, uh, planted the vines and to King David. I mean, it's amazing because today, even when you walk in, let's say, Ella Valley, not far from Jerusalem, you can really walk uh, at the battleground between David and, and Goliath. And today it's full of vines. It's full of grapes. It's beautiful to see it. And so wow. can you imagine... Yes. Sorry, could you share your screen again for us, please? Okay, I'll do that. Let me see because. Um, oh, okay. It was there, and then when when you were pressing some buttons, you came out. Oh, maybe, maybe, so maybe. You just need to share again. We're nearly there. That's it. So if you just pop it on um, full, full screen, we'll, we'll is that okay? Go, uh, almost. That's it. Perfect. Thank okay. You so much. Okay. I'm sorry for the technical uh, problems. No, I'll try to, to 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 uh, rush a bit the history because it's really interesting. I mean, history lives in Israel. That's what I'm trying to say. When you walk in Israel, when you walk, uh, when you go to wineries, history is there. You can really imagine, imagine King David, King Solomon walking the grounds, you know, patting the, 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 the vineyards. And, and it's amazing. One of the oldest um, wine cellars that we find in the Galilee area uh, in Tel Kabiri, we're talking about 3,600 years ago. So you really, really um, can um, appreciate in Israel the history of the winemaking. It's, uh, it's still alive. And um, when we talk about the Golden Age, of course, we're talking about the Hellenistic, when the Greek and the Roman uh, uh, were uh, in Israel, they actually... Um, were a lot of merchants there and they sold a lot of Israeli wines coming, wines coming from, from the land of Israel um, to where today uh, we found uh, France and, and Italy and, and Spain. So, so wines from Israel were traveling all over the world during that time. Um, at the time, also wine was for religious purposes. I mean, uh, uh, it was also a medicine and if you want to praise your gods, uh, wherever, whatever god you were uh, um, uh, praying for, wine was part of the, the rituals. So we're talking about many, many years. But then there was the Ottoman period and the Arab conquest where actually um, uh, wines was uh, stopped producing. Because as you know, Muslim are believed not to drink wine and it's not allowed in their, in their uh, uh, religious. So suddenly no wine making and uh, almost no uh, vines um, for uh, wine in Israel. There were a few, I would say, you know, almost uh, uh, a few vineyards just for really, really for priests and for rabbis to make wines at the time. But uh, we're talking about the destruction or the, the actually the disappearing of all the wine history of the time. But don't worry, it came back. What happened in the 19th century, few uh, family come back to Jerusalem um, and they settled in the old city. And in 1970, the Tepperberg family founded the, almost the first, I guess, uh, um, cottage industry, boutique winery, if we call it in a kind of fashion marketing uh, uh, word, uh, um, a winery. But usually it was made for local consumption, uh, mainly sweet, red, kosher, sacramental wine. This is what they used to drink at the time. We'll talk about kosher wine in a minute, but uh, usually um, uh, they 
at the beginning, it was always uh, sweet wines because, you know, when you welcome the Shabbat, you want to have something sweet uh, to drink and uh, sweet in your heart, sweet in your soul. So we used to make a lot of uh, sweet wines at the time. But 120 years ago, 1882, uh, a very famous uh, Jewish person, Baron Edmund de Rothschild, came and he actually established the modern um, Israeli industry. He built two amazing wineries. Um, and after that, he almost gave it as a present to the, the vintners. And it, today they call it Carmel Winery. By the way, Tapa family and the Carmel Winery still exist until today. They're considered to be um, uh, the leading uh, wineries in Israel. They're considered to be one of the biggest wineries in Israel. And they make a lot, a lot of amazing wines, Carmel and the Tapa family. So at the time, when we talk about 1882, uh, that was the, the renaissance, we call it, of the Israeli wines. Suddenly, um, Jews all over the world can drink again kosher Israeli wines, wines coming from the Holy Land. Um, they used to drink it mainly for um, uh, sacramental purposes, as part of our religious, uh, before the, when we get married, uh, for the Shabbat, for all our tradition and all our holidays, we usually uh, drink wine. Uh, so for hundreds of years, we used to make uh, kind of, um, let's say, medium style wine. Some of them was, uh, most of it was sweet, some of it was dry, semi-dry, but really kind of a medium style wine, not very uh, um, expensive. Mainly it was, as I said, for uh, religious purposes. Um, but then, but then, ta -da! Um, what happened, uh, we had a visitor coming from UC Davis, Professor Cornelius O, and he came as a, a, a guest uh, to Israel in um, 1974, and um, he realized, actually, this is a great land of having amazing uh, wines, and he actually started to consult and he said, listen, you can have amazing um, international grapes here, not the grapes that only the Baron Edmund Rothschild, because Edmund Rothschild, don't forget, he's, uh, a, a, I mean, his family, uh, you think about Rothschild, you think about Mouton, uh, Mouton Rothschild, you think about Chateau Lafitte, so you think about Bordeaux, you think about um, uh, um, grapes coming from France. And yes, at the time, we used to have a lot of Carignan and Grenache and Semillon and, and, and um, all these uh, grapes that uh, actually came with uh, Baron de Rothschild. And Professor Cornelius from the United States said, listen, this is amazing place for Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Chardonnay. So what happened in the north, in the north of Israel, in the, Galil, uh, uh, in the, in the Golan Heights winery, we, um, there was um, a new winery came uh, about and um, established a new winery in 1983. And um, that actually symbolized the quality revolution. After uh, Golan Heights winery, um, we started uh, to drinking more quality wine. We started uh, in Israel, um, uh, understanding more about wine, suddenly more and more um, uh, lessons and, and seminars and courses about wines, and suddenly you see more Israeli wines on the uh, wine menus. And in 1989, that was the beginning of what we call the boutique wine revolution. Um, the first, uh, the first, uh, um, uh, the first winery was Margalit Winery. Professor Yair Margalit came from the United States after a year of studying and he opened the first boutique winery. And after that, kind of a flood of uh, boutique wineries, more and more, people are looking for, uh, to plant more vines and suddenly you see the vines that it used to be in the middle of Israel, I'll show you a map in a minute, going north and going east and looking for high grounds and going up and up to make quality um, grapes. So we talk about the map. Let's see where we are located. Everybody knows this. Everybody that loves wine know this, uh, knows this map. This is the map of the world with the two um, places that you can grow wines. 
and usually they said, okay, where is Israel? Where is Israel? Well, Israel is so tiny, you cannot see. Yes, Israel is a very small banana-shaped country. It's so tiny that you even cannot see it on this map. But I can promise you, this tiny uh, country have a lot of microclimate, and we have uh, many elevations, and we have different wine regions. So just for example, uh, uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon or Syrah coming from the Golan Heights will be totally different than the wine coming from Judea Hills or coming even from our desert in the Negev. So we have vines and we have winery, wineries coming from all over the country. So quickly go over the wine regions. On the north, just um, uh, near the border of Syria and Lebanon, we have the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights is a beautiful place to grow wines. It's high in elevation, over 1,000 meter above sea level. Uh, in the North Golan, it's mainly volcanic soil and um, uh, snow in the winter, uh, hot summer, beautiful, beautiful place to grow wines. And we have the south of the Golan, just um, above the uh, Sea of Galilee that you can see there. Uh, also, uh, many, many um, great uh, vines coming from the south of the Golan. On the left-hand side, when you see the word Tzfat, Tzfat is one of our holy cities in the north of Israel, you see the Galileria. Galileria is, I think, the prettiest uh, uh, vine, um, vine area in, in Israel. You see here forest and, and, and rivers and, and vines. And you have amazing views uh, of, uh, of uh, vines. And, and, and the land is a combination of uh, terra rossa and chalk and, and, and lime and, 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 and volcanic soil and a bit of gravel. So even the land is different and the altitude is different. Um, so you can have a lot of different um, characters of, uh, of um, uh, terroir and um, uh, land coming from one area. On the, um, on the shore, when you see Haifa, Tel Aviv, that's, this is our uh, shore, this is our beach, and you have a lot of um, uh, vines over there. This is like the place of our mass production uh, uh, vineyards, but it's beautiful because you have all the time the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, you have uh, the cooling down effect, the breeze coming from the sea. So even when it's not, when it's hot, it's not that hot because you have the afternoon um, breeze and it cools down the vines. So it's always um, uh, it's always um, um, quality uh, climate. Samaria, also Gush Etzion is a beautiful, kind of an ancient, when you think about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, maybe you should think about that area. Um, beautiful high elevation uh, of uh, vineyards. And then we'll come to the, the Judea. The Judea, usually we, we, um, uh, we uh, divided three, uh, three sections. We have the Judean coast, which is almost sea level. We have the Judean foothills. Most of the wineries are located there and the Judean hills. Beautiful, beautiful, high, um, um, almost we call, call it the central mountain. Um, uh, and most of the quality vineyards are uh, located there. And then we have in the south, we have our Negev. This is the desert. Now, most of the desert, you cannot, it's impossible to grow grape there, but there is some spaces that you can, that are really high, over uh, 500, some, some of them are even 800 meters above sea level. And that's a perfect, perfect place to, uh, to grow vines. Uh, some of them really near the border with Egypt. Um, and you have the, the durational uh, between, the, uh, between the day and night is quite high. So you'll have sometimes 15 and sometimes more um, uh, percentage or, or your degrees uh, difference between daytime and nighttime. So if we're talking about duration, uh, this is a perfect uh, place to have this um, um, day and night um, uh, thing. 
So this is the, the wine regions of Israel. Uh, as I said, very small, but uh, a lot of microclimate and different terroir. In the Negev, we have sandy hills. Uh, so as I said, in the north, we have volcanic terroirs in the coastline, choke volcanic soil and limestone in the hills and sandy and clay in the south. When I say south, I'm talking about our, um, our desert and the, the Negev highlands. Um, as I said, it's a small country, so only 13,500,000 uh, acres under vines. Um, not a lot of production, I have to say. Um, but because we cannot afford ourselves to do mass production, uh, our wines is target for a quality uh, wine. Most of 99% of our wines are quality wines. So we hardly have kind of this, um, I wouldn't say cheap, but non-expensive uh, uh, wines. Most of our wines are premium wines, quality wines, and of course, different prices. Um, the climate, Mediterranean. I mean, it's funny when you, uh, sometimes people talk about California, Mediterranean, uh, sometimes Australia, Mediterranean. No, Mediterranean is Israel. This is like the birthplace of Mediterranean. So yes, we have a Mediterranean climate, long, hot, dry summers. It's, um, and we, when we talk about long summers, we're talking about like seven, sometimes eight months of kind of a summer. The winter is short. Uh, we have some snow on, on, on higher ground, but also, again, short period. It's not like Switzerland when you can go for three months skiing, no. <laughs> um, and in the, in the desert, semi-arid and desert condition. It is hot there, man. That's why we irrigate. We need to irrigate, otherwise there is no, uh, we don't have any chances to our vines. Although, and this is a, 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 a big although, um, some of our vineyards starting more and more in the last few years not to be irrigated because they're um, old vines and some of the roots are dug enough deep to get their own uh, water. So you'll find in many places vines that are not irrigated. But as I said, and as you know, most of the new vines, uh, most of the new um, vineyards, and of course in the south you need, you must, irrigate. Otherwise, we will not have wines. At the harvest, um, uh, we have, uh, because of our uh, uh, microclimate, we have kind of a long period of harvest, mid to late July um, until the end of October. Sometimes, yes, sometimes even early November, we still harvest in, in, in Israel. Uh, most of it is uh, machine, of course, but we have a lot of places with, with uh, hand harvesting. So um, mainly for uh, um, premium quality wine and some of our sparkling wines, of course, we do hand harvest. So of course, in boutique wineries uh, and boutique vineyards when you don't need this uh, giant uh, machine. So people are going, it's usually a family thing, uh, family and friends, they get together, they go out and they, they um, they do the harvest together. It's a, it's a, I did some, almost every year I joined a, 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 an harvest and it's, a, yeah, it's a hard job, but, uh, but it's fun. It's really fun. And I suggest to anyone that haven't been harvest uh, in his life, go ahead, find a winery and, and do the harvest. It's fun. It is fun. Right. Um, we talk about the appellation. We talk about the, the, the places in the region. Um, I have to say, Israel has no uh, appellation system per se. We don't. Good and bad. I mean, uh, uh, we, we like, um, you must uh, plan here or you must do this or you, you, you're allowed to. Uh, we don't have almost any rules of um, uh, harvesting or, or doing. So we do a lot of experimenting. And although Israel is a kind of an ancient wine country, is also a new kind of country. And we're still looking to learn our vines, to learn our uh, land, to learn what the best to do with our, um, uh, with our uh, uh, vine uh, vineyards and what kind of wine 
to make. So it's all the time is a kind of a, a amazing, interesting process of learning all the time. Um, but I have to say about Judean Hill that this is quite new. This is only for the last year. Judean is the uh, is the first uh, and only region at the moment with a form of recognition as an appellation of uh, origin. Um, so this is the first, and I hope. Uh, in the future, many will come and we can find the appellation of the Golan and the Galil and, and, and maybe other uh, places. So this is uh, just to, to let you know about the appellation system. We don't have, but we do follow some rules in during labeling. So if you find um, on the label that says Galil, coming from Galil, means that usually 85, uh, minimum of 85% of the vines of the uh, of the grapes are coming from the Galil area. And also with uh, single grape variety, if you find on the label uh, 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 Petit Verdon, you'll find that 85% uh, minimum, 85% of the bottle is made by um, this wine single variety. So we do follow this kind of uh, wine laws. It's very interesting um, and, um, and uh, uh, people should know about it. Right, about Israel. Um, wineries, if I had a time tunnel, um, uh, I could take you 40 years, uh, uh, 30 years um, ago, we had only seven wineries. I mean, the 80s, beginning of 80s, we have kind of a seven wineries making mainly red, uh, kosher, sacramental wines. Yes, some white, some uh, semi-dry, um, but that was it seven wineries, big wineries, and today we have more than 300 wineries. Amazing. It's kind of a slow but quality revolution that um, came all over the, the, the country. Uh, we have large, around 60 large commercial uh, wineries that um, produce uh, many kinds of wines and, uh, um, and, and about 300 are considered to be boutique and what we call garagist uh, or family uh, wineries. Um, and we have some big wineries that uh, produce uh, over 6 million bottles a year, like uh, um, a Carmel winery that I mentioned, they produce around uh, 10, uh, some say 12 million bottles a year. So yes, we do have some uh, big production of wines, but same big production, I don't mean that uh, all the wines is uh, mass production. At the contrary, uh, most of the, a lot of the wine that they make, uh, because they are so big, uh, they make big quality uh, award-winning trophy and gold medal uh, winning wines in these uh, wineries. Beautiful, beautiful uh, wines. Um, influences, well, I mean, you can start when the influence of Baron Edmond de Rothschild when he's, he came with his uh, team. So you have a kind of a French uh, uh, tradition and knowledge in, in the uh, 19th century. But then a um, hundred years later, you have the Californian expertise. You have uh, more of a kind of a new world um, uh, influence in the uh, 2000s. Uh, you have more kind of an Australian uh, influence. Uh, more and more um, uh, labs and, and supporting techniques and and today today this I think this is the most interesting time in the time of the Israeli wineries because we do everything people are curious they want to study more and more so you have from natural organic um, a lot of our wineries are sustainable uh, uh, use sustainable techniques so you see the evolution of wine making, and I think there is no better time to drink an Israeli wine than now. I mean, if someone would say, oh, I drank Israeli wine 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they don't make wine like they used to do make. And I said, yes, thank you. Better not to drink wines from 40 years ago. I mean, some of them were good, but most of them were, you know, today, really amazing, amazing, award-winning, I think unique, so unique, you can really taste the land, you can really taste the, the, the character of, of Israel through the wines. 
and and some of the wines you can really enjoy the sun and 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 the the ocean through through these uh, bottles beautiful beautiful wines coming from israel um i know that usually people ask me about grape varieties what is uh, the indigenous uh, grape varieties in israel yes we do have but as i said we do experiment and we do have everything and because we don't have uh, kind of a strong and uh, severe appellation system we can do whatever we want and we love it so um just to mention the production is me uh reds we still do amazing reds 65 percent approximately okay um uh, red wines we do a lot of white wines people are more and more enjoying white wines of course it's a hot country so uh people are trying to um uh drink uh, cold wine uh crispy wines uh, uh, white wine we have amazing rosés we have some orange wine we do make sparkling wines um uh, what we call the traditional method and we have dessert wine now when i talk about dessert wine i'm not talking about sweet kosher sacramental wine i'm talking about like um, a proper dessert wine late harvest uh some of them even botrytis wine um and even ice wines yes we do have kind of a high heights wine uh in israel so we have everything and of course uh, uh let's say port style or from uh like uh, more um, um uh, wines that are um uh, with alcohol um right shall we go oh that's the most amazing i love this list so we have the the um i love this uh, um uh, this uh, 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 list because you can see how many uh, uh, grapes we use we, we use the Cabernet Sauvignon, the Merlot, and the Syrah, and the Shiraz. And by the way, when I say Syrah, Shiraz, you'll have, when uh, you can have like a, a, a North Syrah uh, wine with a beautiful kind of a peppery style, violet, more uh, like this, um, like the North Front style. And you can have a full body monster Shiraz, the same country, you'll have both of them. And we have the Cabernet Franc. Um, more and more people like the Cabernet Franc in Israel, and it's really considered to be a more kind of an Israeli Mediterranean uh, grape variety. The Carignan is doing a big comeback. I mean, it used to be a mass uh, production, uh, production uh, a grape for doing a lot of wines. Today, you'll find some uh, amazing old vines uh, making super premium uh, wine. So the Carignan is doing uh, a comeback. The Durif, or what we call the Petit Syrah, also big in Israel, beautiful wine. Petit Verdot, I mean, when you talk about Petit Verdot, usually you, you do a reference like a, a blend wine. Okay, we'll add a bit of Petit Verdot to have maybe some structure, some, uh, um, you know, tannins. No, we have 100% Petit Verdot, beautiful masculine beautiful wine um made from petit verdot and we have malbec and we have our pinot noir and the mauvedre and the grenache and the Biola and pinotage yeah you think you're in, in in italy no it's all in israel and we talk about white we talk about the chardonnay sauvignon blanc i mean guys try and have an israeli sauvignon blanc don't think about the new zealand style don't think about kind of a sharp uh sancerre try to think about a marriage between these two um uh um, grape styles between two these two wine styles but under a marriage chupa in in the holy in the holy land it's beautiful we have a nice sauvignon blanc our gavur Traveler is really really fashionable at the moment Viognier, white Riesling, Emerald Riesling is doing also a comeback. Um, uh, the Columbard, uh, Muscato Rala Alexandria is, is big in Israel also, mainly for uh, uh, dessert wine. Our Chenin Blanc is, go I think, is going to be one of our signature uh, grapes. Beautiful, beautiful wines coming from Chenin Blanc, Semyon, Roussin, Marsan, Pinot Blanc, all this in Israel. And if you didn't have enough, let's continue. 
Yes, we have San Jovese and we have Tanat and we have the Tempranil and Trigue Nacional and Tintacao, like here in Portugal, and we have the Zinfandel and two indigenous uh, grapes, Argaman and the Bituni. I'll speak about them in a minute. And the white, we have the Muscat Caleli and Pinot Gris and the Marawi uh, and the Jandali and the Lebuki and the Baladi. And you think, what is this? This is our, uh, some of our uh, unique um, grape varieties that we do a lot of wine. Let me quickly go over that. Well, first of all, the Argaman. The Argaman was created in 72 in order to give us kind of a grapes, the a grape that give a, a lot of color. We wanted to have kind of uh, a, a grape that is, uh, is strong, can uh, survive the heat. So we did a cross between Carignan and Cezau and we created this uh, Argaman. Yes, at the beginning it was mainly to give color to a lot of our wines, but today with all vines and special treatment, we have amazing Argaman coming from um, some uh, uh, exclusive uh, wineries. If you're looking for something special, try to look for Argaman. It's a sometimes spicy, uh, ripe fruits and smoky, beautiful, beautiful wine. So look for Argaman. Argaman in Hebrew, a, is a, is a color of kind of a between red and purple, kind of a magenta uh, color. This is what argaman means. Uh, Bituni. Uh, some someone said to me, this is the answer of Pinot Noir. It's also a very ancient uh, local variety. Um, it's a beautiful. Um, uh, we started now uh, making more and more uh, wines out of Bituni. Uh, Again, ancient, this is uh, kind of a light, flowery, aromatic, um, special wine. Nothing like you tasted before. Uh, this is the reds, let's go to the whites. The Marawi, some call it uh, Hamdani, ancient indigenous grape. Uh, it was found by mistake, actually a com combination between, uh, the beginning was uh, the combination of um, an Israeli uh, winery and uh, Palestinian vineyards and they found out that they, they can make unique uh, uh, wines out of it. It's, it's a beautiful, I mean, this is nothing like you tasted before. I mean, when you think about, this is a real Mediterranean. It's not, it's not when you call about fruity wine or a floral wine or herbaceous, this is more, a combination of all of that and mainly in test aromas. So look for a Marawi uh, or Hamdamni and you'll have a totally different experience um, than the rest of the white wines that you know. Um, the Buki is also very interesting. The Buki actually um, a, was a, a, an eating grape and the name in Arabic Devek, the Buki means um, like a glue. It's so sweet. The grapes are so sweet. It's like glue your mouth. So you can um, imagine um, uh, a lot of sugar, but also beautiful acidity in one grape. So we have the Dabuki and the more and more wineries are now doing um, uh, uh, wines from Dabuki. Some of them are 100% Dabuki. Some of them are blending it with Sauvignon Blanc and, um, and Gewurztraminer. Look for the Dabuki. Again, really, really interesting. Um, let's continue. Many times Israeli wines are, um, are uh, like um, connected to kosher wines. So I have to tell you by now, okay? None of all the Israeli wines are kosher and none all the kosher wines coming from Israel. I mean, you have a lot of um, <coughs> kosher wines coming from all over the world. Um, but uh, Israel is, of course, the, the, the main quality uh, manufacturer of kosher wine. So when I say keeping the kosher, what is kosher? I would immediately say kosher is a style, style of making wine. Like when you think about biodynamic, or when you think about organic, or when you think about natural wine, right? So it's a style, it's a philosophy, it's a way of uh, making wine, um, uh, uh, mainly 
um, based on tradition method. So um, this is what we call kosher wine. Um, I would say again, the manufacturing wine of the wine from the harvest till bo the bottle is similar, similar, totally similar uh, to the way that you make wine all over the world. But uh, to be kosher, you need special condition. And let me do it quickly. Kosher means to fit, like fitting to the uh, tradition of the observant Orthodox Jews that keep the Shabbat, okay? It's very important to them. So most of the wineries, the big wineries, I mean, in Israel, they do a kosher wine for two reasons. First, to respect the people that are looking for a kosher wine uh, in Israel and all over the world. And second is a marketing thing, because if you want to uh, sell more wine, it must be kosher. Um, you'll have double supervision. You'll have, of course, the winemakers, quality uh, assurance in the wineries, but you have also the supervision of the rabbis to make sure that everything is done by the tradition and uh, the quality assurance in, in the vineyards and, and of course, the, the, in, in the winery. When we talk about agricultural rules, we're talking about something that takes us way back to the Bible, meaning uh, I think 99% of our vineyards, when they plant, you do not harvest them until only the fourth year. Only in the fourth year, you're, um, uh, you're allowed to harvest the wines, which is amazing because you give the winery, the vines enough time to, to get strong, you know, to build the character. It's like, you know, it's like sending a child to work. No, you don't send child to work. You want it to grow. You want it to become a man or a woman, and then you can send them to work. Exactly with um, uh, vines, you need them to build a structure, to be strong, and then you can take the grapes out of them. Also, in our tradition, every seven years, you need to let the ground rest. So if you're talking about sensibility, uh, sustainability uh, agriculture, this is what we're talking about, okay? Every seven years, uh, uh, we let the ground rest and only, um, again, we harvest. So uh, in many places, you just leave the, the ground like that. The, the grapes are falling, uh, get nourishment to the ground again. Yes, you take care of it, but you don't, um, uh, you take care of the vines, but you don't, um, take a lot of the uh, the ground. So the ground, the, the um, soil is getting back a lot of minerals and a lot of, I think, energy is the, also a, a good uh, word to use it. Um, once you harvest the grapes from, let's say, crushing time until you bottle and you cork, you seal the bottles, all this thing must be touched by Orthodox Jews that observe the Shabbat, okay? From crushing till the seals uh, with cores or screw cups, whatever, must be uh, taken care of Orthodox Jews. Um, uh, so they, we know that only observant uh, are doing the, um, actually the, the manufacturing of the wine. Um, only kosher substance uh, may be used, and we check that, the fining, the yeast, the ancient, etc., all this. And uh, I uh, put some um, stamps of kashrut, what we call, the, on the sides, so you can usually see them on the back label of the uh, bottles. Uh, some bottles will have more than one um, uh, kashrut label, so they're uh, respecting a lot of, uh, um, let's say, um, they're not religions, but uh, um, uh, current or uh, communities, let's say communities of uh, Orthodox uh, people. Um, there is no legal requirement. I mean, there, I'm talking about like government, no, there's no uh, requirement for making kosher wines. And we have a lot of, uh, um, many of the Israeli wineries are not kosher. Now this is, I'm gonna tell you something that is um, uh, quite um, um, maybe strange to hear, but I think 90, 85% of the uh, overall wines in Israel are kosher, but uh, a lot of the wineries 
are not kosher, if that makes sense. So because there are a lot of uh, boutique wineries, they, 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 they choose not to be kosher. So you'll have more uh, uh, wineries that are, more, uh, that are not kosher, but the overall production of wine in Israel, 80, more than 85, it is kosher, okay? So just to make sense uh, out of that. Um, and to sum it up, kosher wines uh, do not have to be sweet or, you know, taste awful. No, it's a beautiful, beautiful, dry, high quality, award-winning uh, wines. All of them can be kosher. And of course, as the rest of the world, um, uh, some kosher wines are, are suitable for uh, vegetarian and vegans. So uh, we have all that. Now, a bit about uh, Israeli wines around the world. Um, so um, we export. I have to say, in Israel, we drink of most of our wines. We, we, are falling, we, we are in love with Israeli wines and we drink most of our wines ourselves, but we export. We export a lot, mainly for Jewish uh, communities, but not only. Um, so you can find Israeli wines and kosher wines uh, in Michelin stars, uh, um, uh, restaurants all over the world, in wine clubs and wine bars, wherever you go, uh, all over the world. Our main um, uh, market uh, outside of Israel is the United States. And then we have uh, France. Yes, uh, in the United Kingdom here, we have um, uh, also uh, a big community and a lot of wineries from Israel are coming here to to uh, to London. And um, if you're looking for Israeli wines and you don't know where to look for, ask me. Just, I'll give you my email at the end. Just ask me whatever you want and, and I'll tell you where to get it. Or if you want my advice and things like that, I'll tell you again, Germany, Canada. And we're not talking about Asia. Yes, you can find Israeli wines in, um, in, uh, in, in Japan and in China and in Thailand and in Taiwan, and you can find Israeli wines all over. And as maybe some of them, some of you follow the news that um, uh, just a few weeks ago, we signed a, a peace uh, agreement with um, uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi and, uh, and many countries that were, were not in good situation uh, the, la the last uh, years uh, for the longest time. And now you can find Israeli wines in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and all these places. Amazing, exciting. So yes, you can find Israeli wines almost wherever you want. Um, we have two masterful wines. The first one was uh, around Peak, the CEO and the wine chief winemaker of Tsoa Winery. And the um, the, the first um, a picture that I saw, the, I, I show you, uh, the Shorish um, uh, vineyards is uh, belong to Tsoa Winery. Thank you, Aran, for use, uh, let me use this uh, 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 picture. And Idol Levinson, just uh, I think a month ago or maybe uh, two months ago, he again is um, master of wine. So he's the second and the newest um, uh, master of wine that we have is the chief wine winemaker of Bakan Winery. Bakan Winery is their, our biggest winery in Israel. They make also mass mar market wines, but also amazing uh, boutique quality uh, restaurant award-winning wines. So look for Tsara Winery, look for uh, Bakan Winery uh, and taste what these guys are doing with the wines, not only with their knowledge. Um, what else? Um, I think when you talk about wine, you need to um, combine uh, wine with food. It usually go together. So you'll see the, uh, the last few years, the Israeli culinary are, is, is growing and you'll find a lot of Israeli um, um, restaurants um, uh, all over the world. And I'm not talking about you know, another falafel place or uh, another shawarma place uh, making amazing uh, food. No, I'm talking about like high quality Michelin star or, um, you know, high quality restaurant. And um, just to mention, even here uh, in London, you, you know about Yutamo Tolengi and Mary, Mary Radoni, the chef Mary Radoni all over the world, the Sabgranit with his restaurant here. If you think about uh, Cold Shade, 
um, call office, sorry, call office and Barbary and uh, Palomar. Uh, that's all the stuff. Granit um, a restaurant and the Al Shani that I have from New York to to uh, uh, France. Uh, books about Israel, yes, um, uh, about food, um, uh, about uh, culinary. Even I wrote some books. So if you're looking for some books related wine, look for my name on it. And of course, uh, we have all these uh, amazing uh, um, food uh, restaurants are uh, also uh, winning um, a lot of uh, trophies and, and awards. Shaya in the restaurant of the year in the United States. Just look for Israeli culinary and you'll find heaven. Um, why to taste Israeli wines? I think you'll find it something different. I mean, uh, we have, uh, well, for us, for Jews, uh, it's opportunities to support Israel, of course. And, and, and the best kosher wines in the world are coming from Israel. So you have the, the most, um, uh, not only quality, but range of uh, uh, kosher wines from um, like a, a, a minerally uh, a sharp, uh, dry uh, white wines uh, to, to sweet wines, high quality. You have from uh, uh, sparkling wines to, to of course, uh, uh, rosé and, and, and orange wine and, and beautiful red wines. You, so you'll have everything. You try it and you, you can feel Israel. For Christians, yeah, of course, wine's coming from the Holy Land. It's always a nice experience. Uh, sommeliers and wine buyers. I mean, look, guys, with all due respect, if you don't have any Israeli wines on your portfolio, something is missing. Uh, if you don't have wines coming from the one of the most ancient wine countries in the world, your portfolio is not, it's not full. You need, and if you need my advice, guys, for free, I'll give it to you. But you need to have Israeli wines on your portfolio. It's, it's like inconceivable that you don't have Israeli wines on, on your portfolio. And of course, wine gigs. Yeah, like me. We always look for something exotic, something new, something um, interesting to, to taste. Oh, what is this Marawi wine? What is this Dabuki wine? What is this Argaman? Oh, I must taste it. I must taste it the next time I'm going to this um, wine bar or my uh, next wine uh, suppliers. And for foodies, I mean, if you're doing kind of um, Israeli cuisine, you want to cook like a Otolengi, yes, you need the perfect partner, which is Israeli wine. So this is, I think, oh, most of the reason why you need uh, Israeli wines um, uh, in your uh, cellar uh, and at least to taste some of the Israeli wines. Um, I don't have a clue. I have to say I don't have a clue. Yes, I think, I think uh, we're, we're, uh, we're okay with time. Um, so I think I'm, I made it almost uh, 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 one hour. Uh, my email is tal, that's my name, at easy the wine ambassador.co.uk easy to remember the wine ambassador.co.uk write me and i'll try to help you as much as i can and now loren if you're still with me um i'll be more than happy to take any questions uh, if there are any um yes, there's a lot of questions oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <laughs> I uh, hope it was not. Was it okay? No, was I was okay? brilliant. I learned so much. Um, you may well have answered some of these questions as we went through, but I was kind of furiously writing them out, so I, I may have not have noticed. But there's been Fine. some really fantastic questions. Really fantastic questions. Um, there's clearly some knowledge here as well within our audience. But some questions have been answered internally, if you like. Um, I haven't been very helpful, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you. So I've got around 14 questions here. Um, so okay. let's, see, let's see how we go. So thank you everyone for your participation. Um, so first question from Sylvina is, what region is best to grow vines or fruit with good acidity? Higher ground. Um, uh, places like um, north of Israel. So you have the Golan Heights, the, uh, some of the Galil area. 
This is higher grounds, uh, volcanic and, and chalky soil. Some places like in the Judean Hills, perfect for um, uh, white with uh, high acidity um, uh, grapes. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, so I think this was answered, but let's just clarify. What is the name of the desert area for wine? Negev. Negev, Negev is our uh, Negev is our um, the name of our desert. Okay, thank you. That, I think that, that did get answered actually. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you for that question, Sharon. And then um, number three, no, question number three: organic wines. This is an interesting one. Um, is there a lot of it considering the climate? This is from Emily. We do have some, not a lot, not a lot of organic uh, uh, wineries. We have more organic vines than organic wineries. Um, it's not easy to be organic in Israel. It's, it's a process. More and more, uh, more, and more wineries are um, um, being organic, but it's a process. So we don't have a lot. So just about that, is it that people practice organic, but they don't necessarily get the certification? I think, um, you know, organic uh, uh, wine is, um, is a process of also um, uh, learning, okay, of education. You need to convince some people that uh, um, making organic wine will produce uh, better wines because people, usually, most of the people, of course, uh, they don't think about uh, the land of, uh, you know, protecting the land. They think about, okay, if I need to invest, let's say, 20 quid, and a bottle of wine is organic wine will be better than a normal wine or not and we need to educate more and more people about that that you not only buy better you also buy uh protection to the land you you buy sustainability you 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 buy actually something that make an effort to to um to keep our world more safe so it's a process. I, I do uh, know that um, we don't have a lot of organic wines, uh, but it's a process more and more. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, there was an interesting comment about this. Um, drip irrigation is what, so what kind of irrigation do you generally use? So it was, it was um, suggested that it might be drip irrigation and then someone um, said that you invented drip irrigation. So thank you, M. Gabrielli, for that question. Yes, I think it's a common knowledge. Israel invented the drip irrigation I didn't, I didn't um, because, because, um, because, again, you need to think about a hot climate country, very small. We had to um, focus on how to spend the small um, uh, water that we have um, into uh, make it, it um, count. So yes, we do... Um, we use a lot of drip irrigation, and it's not only for irrigation. Sometimes it's uh, to transfer some uh, uh, nutrients oh, into so the vines, and sometimes into control. Yes, yes, okay. yes. So, so is we invented the drip irrigation, and we use it the most. So, yeah, that's one you use most. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so another question, um, quite a few kind of climate questions here. Um, do winemakers have problems due to climate change, for example, drought and heat? And that was um, from Marietti. Um, it's a trick question because some of the places, well, we need to go one by one, but I'll try to make it a general uh, thing. Because we have the breeze coming from the sea, and we have kind of dry influence coming from the east, okay? So we don't have like a um, uh, um, humid climate. So botrytis kind of a thing is a rare thing for us. We don't have a lot of um, uh, um, rot uh, in Israel. So um, what we try to do is to uh, try instead of expose the, the the grapes to the vines we try to hide them and to give kind of a uh, leaf over protecting uh, the vines and um, 
we use a lot of the VSP um, um, canopy system. Uh, so in one hand, you protect the vines, but on the other hand, you expose it to the, 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 uh, to the winds and the breeze coming. Okay, so, right, so just varying climates. Very, um, yes, sort of very good. Like yeah. Okay, um, what are the main, they had some questions and, and some terminology that I wasn't familiar with, I'm not sure everyone was familiar with. Um, so um, what are the main reasons to organise a winery as kosher or not kosher? I, you may have answered that. Well, I, I think it's, it's two things. First of all, it's a matter of belief. It's a matter if you are a observant Jew and you believe uh, and you're a religious person, you want your production to be kosher. So this is why some of the wineries are kosher because this is my belief. This is why I. This is way the way I want to 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 make the wines. Second is a marketing thing. A lot of uh, boutique wineries started in uh, as non-kosher, uh, and then when they grow, they needed to expose their wines to more and more communities and then they, uh, they become uh, kosher. Now, to become kosher winery, it's not an easy process. You need to change your labels of the wines because people can com become confused from, is it kosher, is it not kosher? You need to change the label. So it will be look, the, the look and feel will be totally different. And suddenly uh, the winemaker is not touching himself, uh, but uh, observant Jews are doing the, the, the wines. Okay, now there was some um, terminology. So, so someone was asking, kosher can be um, sorry, mevushel or non-mevushel. And I wasn't sure what that meant or what the difference was. I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll make it quick because I can have another seminar or another webinar only <laughs> about kosher laws. Mevushel means that uh, the wine has gone in, in, in the process, usually it's a flask pasteurization of the grape juice before it, it become wine, meaning that as a religious thing, it doesn't consider to be considered to be a wine to, for um, religious purposes, okay? So if I'm going to a wedding and a non-Jew person, or no, not even a non-Jew, a non-Orthodox uh, person, serve the wine for me, I can drink it because it became mevushal, mean pasteurized wine. 99% of the wines in Israel are non-mevushal, so they don't go into this pasteurization process. Okay, that sounds like a whole but other the best webinar. thing, if you need kind of more, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. If someone really wants, write me an email, I'll send the real uh, method of what is the difference between mevushal and non mevushal. Okay, Easy. I mean, just to get to have an idea of what those, what those words mean. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, just a couple more, bear with us. Um, do you expect to have more appellation rules and what would we think of that? And that was from Martin. Martin, thank you for this question. I think, yes, we'll have more appellation uh, rules. It's a process. I think if we want as a country to become uh, or to belong to the um, um, wine industry around the world and how people expect wine and how to read wine and how to understand wine, we need more demarcation, we need more um, uh, rules in order that people will able to, to read or even to understand. And even when you do level three or level four, the diploma in WE said, you'll have Israeli wines and then the rules like you have in other countries. Yeah, it makes it a bit easier to understand sometimes, doesn't it? Um, exactly. So um, we've got a few questions about importing and exporting and stuff like that, mostly exporting actually. Um, is most Israeli wine consumed domestically or is there an export market as well? That was from David. Thank you, David. Well. Around 80 to 85 percent of the wines in Israel are local. They drink local in Israel. We love our wine. It goes great with our food. We drink it. But we know that we have to supply uh, our beautiful wines to, to any other places. So 15, it depends on the year, of course, but 15 to 20 percent are export 
um, around the world, from Australia to Europe, from Japan to Canada, uh, from Africa to everywhere. Amazing. We had a good, um, good old chat about France. Um, so I'll link this to Emily's question. Um, she said, you said that France was your number two market. And what was yes. the reason behind that? And um, what's your target consumer? Because um, those of us who visit France or live in France, when you go to the shops, you don't see a lot of wines that aren't from France. Yeah, you're right. But I think uh, the, the, the right question or the right answer is quite um, uh, quite uh, um, um, quite straightforward. Uh, two reasons. First of all, we have a lot of Jewish communities in France, mm. so and they support uh, the Jewish uh, uh, wine industry. So they buy kosher wine and they, they buy Israeli wines. That's why we have a lot in France. But also, a lot of the chefs, a lot of the restaurateurs in France, um, uh, they. They started the, the last, I think, 20 years to appreciate Israeli wines. And because, you know, uh, they want something special, they want something unique in their, in their wine menu. So that's why you'll find many Israeli wines in, in a lot of uh, restaurants and hotels uh, around France. Mainly five stars and Michelin stars, yes. Oh, that's very interesting. Didn't, didn't expect yeah. that answer. Um, okay, so a few more, just a couple more. Um, so another kosher question, can winemakers produce non-kosher wines from grapes grown in the seventh year or the sabbatical year? I think this can be a simple yes or no answer. And if anyone wants to know more, they'll have to email you, I think. The answer is yes, there is a way to, to do that. Uh, but yes, if someone wants, just write me an email and I'll answer everything. Good. Um, Okay, here's, here's a question. Um, I'm not sure about the wording, um, but yeah, so thank you for that um, last question, Tony. So this is a question from Edwin. How is it possible to make reasonable wine in the area of the Negev Desert? I'm, I'm absolutely quoting that question. No, no, it's a very good question. You have to understand that our desert is not like the Sahara Desert, right? It's, it's, um, we have the, the, the um, it's a high altitude. We're talking about 800 meter above sea level it's dry it's not uh, uh again it's not a sandy sahara thing so when you plant the wine you give it the right irrigation the vine goes into the ground deeply get its own nourishments and then you have the most amazing vines uh add to that the the, the durational between day and night and and you'll see amazing wines coming from the desert Fantastic. I mean, yeah, let's face it. We've got lots of arid places, you know, central Spain, for example, you know, it is, it is very possible. Um, so what percentage of wines are contributed by boutique wineries? I think this was from David. I can't, um, this question. Can, can you, sorry, can you repeat so, the question? Because... What percentage of wines are contributed by boutique wineries? Oh, it's only, I think it's something like 20% uh, uh, from all the wine consumption, uh, wine production, production in Israel is coming from the boutique small wineries. Okay. Um, as uh, the majority of the, the wines are coming from our more industrial wines. So we have like 60, uh, 50 to 60 uh, big wineries that make most of the wines in the boutique family uh, are around 20 percent okay thank you for that that's not a bad percentage is it really yeah um so just last couple of questions where can you buy israeli wines in brazil that's from pollyanna and i think we have quite a brazilian contingent here this evening so i think they'd like to know well in brazil you'll 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 get some uh, shops uh, that you'll uh, you can get I think the best thing, I'm not in Brazil at the moment, but again, if someone wants, send me an email, I will find again where is the shop, where is the place you can buy. But just look for um, synagogues, uh, Jewish communities, where you find Jewish communities, when you find synagogues, you for sure find Israeli wines there. And I also think there was a recommendation somewhere in the chat there as well. So we've got some really... Um, very helpful participants here um, this evening. Um, there's just a couple more questions that have just popped up. 
Um, so, um, Sylvina is asking about the skin of the grapes. Are they thicker because they grow in the Negev desert? Well, you know, um, we use, in the Negev, we use the, the thick uh, grapes like, uh, you know, the, like Syrah and like uh, the, the, the Cabernet Sauvignon, but you, because we experiment a lot and, and you think desert, you think heat, but again, it's high altitude. Some places, uh, like in Yatir, you'll have snow in winter and you'll have cherries um, there. So some of the places you can even have Pinot Noir. So it's, it's, it's not a yes or no question. You can find almost everywhere. But uh, in, in overall, yes, you'll find the fake um, uh, uh, grape uh, skin in, in the hot areas. Okay, fantastic. Um, Did I answer? I, um, I think you've I, answered. I hope I, I think, answer. I think you've answered that question. Um, one person did ask a bit about botrytis, but at the same time, you were talking about the lack of botrytis. Do you have any botrytis wines? And if you do, what are the grape varieties? Well, we don't have every year, and we don't have usually botrytis. It's okay. like amazing years, and 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 you know we had. Once in the in the uh, 80s, we had, I think it was 87, we had Petraitis wine coming from the Galil area. Uh, uh, I know that Carmel wine is doing another Petraitis wine. It's, it's not every day, it's not every year, it's rare. But when we have it, we jump all over it and we'll do an amazing Petraitis wine. And mainly from... Um, it depends, but it's Semillon, Semillon and, and, and Sauvignon Blanc, usually. Well, of course, if the Rothschilds are going to make a botrytis wine, it's going to be the Bordeaux grape variety, isn't it? Of um, course. And, um, yeah, so someone just asked quickly, I think this is the last question, I think it is. Um, so okay. someone, said, well, Sylvia, Sylvia, is Sylvia, who said, um, soils are, so soils are mixed composition. I think they want to know what, are, what is the composition? You'll find everything. I think uh, we had uh, many uh, Bordeaux combination, uh, uh, let's say 20 or 10 years ago. Today, uh, it's more a combination of uh, Rhone Valley and, and Mediterranean. So you'll have the Cabernet and Syrah. Um, uh, you have the Syrah and the Viognier. Uh, and, and you have a lot of combination, beautiful combination. But more and more experiment, more and more kind of a Rhone style wines, more and more Israeli. Uh, when you think about the combination, like 55% Dabuki, 25% uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and 20% Gewurz Traminer in one of our um, beautiful um, Femitage wine coming from the Tepperberg winery. I mean, this is unique. This is, you won't find anywhere in the world. And when you taste the wine, you say, wow, this is amazing, it's really wine. So yes, this is more the direction that we're going now. More local, independent, uh, Mediterranean uh, um, combinations. Well, I think this, your enthusiasm, Al, is absolutely infectious. We've had so many people saying how much they've so thoroughly enjoyed this um, presentation and they think Thank you're a fantastic so presenter. Wow. You know, it's been so easy to listen to you and you've made things so understandable. This really has been a fantastic session with you this evening, Carl. So thank you so much on behalf of everyone watching, on behalf of WSET School. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to have you here with us um, this evening. Um, you know, I think I'm getting a lot of um, a lot of people saying, when is Israel going to be more on the specification for the level three and, and level four? And I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. So you see what you've done now, Tal, you've made my life quite difficult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's been absolutely brilliant. And, you know, you've really, really waved the Israeli flag for wine there. And I think there's going to be a lot more people um, trying these wines out. They certainly sound absolutely brilliant. So thank you ever so much. It was my pleasure and honour participating uh, tonight or this morning, wherever you are <laughs> in the world. Um, Please share with me your thoughts, write me an email,